Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Dan Scheiman, Vice President of Audubon Society of Central Arkansas. Welcome to our meeting. It's my pleasure tonight to introduce our guest speaker, Nate Weston, who is the geospatial ecologist for Beaver Watershed Alliance. The Alliance promotes voluntary best management practices to landowners and municipalities in the Beaver Lake watershed. Nate has worked in landscape and restoration ecology, natural resources management, and environmental education since 2014. Previously, he helped manage the Jewel Moore Nature Reserve while earning his degree at UCA, then worked as a GIS analyst at Arkansas Natural Heritage Commission. He has expertise in erosion, native and invasive plant ecology, habitat management, and the development of management plans. Nate also serves as president of Arkansas Native Plant Society and treasurer of the Multi-Basin Regional Water Council. And no surprise, he is an enthusiastic supporter of native plant landscaping, as many of us are. So take it away, Nate. Yeah, well, hi, everyone. It's a uh, thank you all very much for, for inviting me here. Uh, just gonna start my screen share. <clears throat> and uh, like Dan said, I do not mind if folks want to ask me questions. Uh, I'll probably be chatting away though. So um, if you do have a question, feel free to, to chime in or or type it in the chat in the chat box. <clears throat> But um, like Dan said, I'm the geospatial ecologist for the Beaver Lake for the uh, Beaver Watershed Alliance, and uh, we're a nonprofit water quality organization located out of Elkins, Arkansas, up in the northwest quarter. Um, and our primary mission is to uh, protect, enhance, and sustain the water quality of Beaver Lake and the integrity of its watershed. And we primarily do that ooh, through uh, education and outreach, uh, technical assistance, and uh, planning and analysis. Uh, we have a seven-person staff. Uh, we are in the process of hiring a program director right now, so I don't have a name for that person just yet. Uh, I know who it is, but I can't announce it yet. <laughs> We're very excited for this person. And we have a 20-member board of directors who uh, assists us and guides us in our, in our mission, make sure we, we uh, as a nonprofit organization, follow our mission. Uh, if you're not familiar with the with the Beaver Lake watershed, uh, this highlighted area in lighter tan is the uh, White River uh, Basin, and uh, the White River goes up to Beaver Lake, goes to Beaver Dam, that drains into Table Rock Lake, and then it goes into Bull Shoals Lake, and eventually goes into the White River, which goes all the way down south and uh, uh, confluences or meets tributes with the uh, uh, Mississippi River and the Little and the uh, um, Arkansas River near the near the town of uh, Watson, Arkansas. <clears throat> but uh, when we refer to the Beaver Lake watershed, uh, our program area is everything uh, upstream or above Beaver Dam itself. Uh, we're a priority uh, watershed. So basically what that means is the state of Arkansas and other organizations recognize that drinking water sources in Arkansas uh, are priority um, because they're economic drivers uh, um, for drinking water quality, uh, um, industry, commerce, agriculture, and things like that, and recreation. And so the red area up there in the top left is, is the Beaver Reservoir. But like I said, we our program area is everything uh, upstream of the of Beaver Dam itself, whereas the Beaver Reservoir is technically everything above uh, Table Rock Dam. So this, this, this multicolor area is the uh, Beaver Lake watershed. Um, watersheds kind of have a, uh, they're kind of nested, so they have a hierarchy. Um, so when you get into a watershed, it breaks down into sub watersheds and things like that. So within the Beaver Lake watershed, uh, we have the smaller sub watersheds. Um, Beaver Lake was, is not a natural lake. Uh, in North America, the only natural lakes are ones that were created by glaciers. And uh, in this case, uh, Beaver Lake was, was created artificially or by humans. Um, it was created in the 1960s primarily for flood control, hydroelectric power, and then later on drinking water was added on top of that. Um, and uh, the watershed area is 1,200 square miles, and that's uh, roughly 763,000 acres. <clears throat> uh, there are some features that primarily define our watershed. So we have steep slopes. Um, we're part of the, uh, the uh, 
Ozark Mountains, which is a very, very old mountain range. So it's heavily weathered, heavily eroded. Um, so we have steep slopes, really, really uh, uh, sharp elevations, not as high as the Rockies, but very rugged. Um, we have a lot of springs, and those springs are really caused by uh, karst geology. So karst geology, if you're not familiar with it, is a uh, calcium-based or calcareous bedrock material, and it's water-soluble. So over time, groundwater tends to erode uh, that groundwater, or excuse me, erode that uh, limestone, calcium rock, and it creates these large caverns and chambers and things like that. So it can store a lot of groundwater, which is great, but it also allows the movement of that water uh, very quickly. And also it, it tends to be more susceptible to contaminants leaching into the soil uh, versus other, other types of uh, geology and groundwater. Uh, we're a heavily forested watershed. So our watershed is primarily 62% forest. We have a lot of pasture. That's almost a quarter of our watershed. And uh, 7% uh, as of 2019 was developed. Um, we're one of the fastest growing regions in the United States. So we're seeing that number go up pretty quickly. And we're looking at possibly that number jumping up to 10 to 15% within the next 20 years. And so we're, we're battling a lot of rapid land use change and the challenges that come with that. Like I said earlier, the Beaver Watershed or Beaver Lake is uh, very important for, for us in the Northwest Arkansas region. It's the primary drinking water source for roughly one in six Arkansans or half a million Arkansans. Uh, water gets pumped from Beaver Lake and it goes all the way to Harrison, Arkansas and to the Oklahoma border and beyond and generates quite a bit of electricity uh, annually for the area as well as driving tourism and uh, economic growth. So. A lot of people tend to not think about uh, drinking water quality as a, as a driver of economic business, but a lot of times when a business uh, is considering moving to a location and uh, water is a component of their product, they, they will oftentimes look for places which have high quality drinking water at, at good prices. And so the Beaver Lake is uh, in Northwest Arkansas in general is, is, one, are, is one of those. And of course, Central Arkansas is as well because Central Arkansas water does a fantastic job. <clears throat> when I said we were a priority watershed earlier, one of the key factors that we look at is uh, erosion. Um, a lot of times people talk about uh, water pollution and a lot of times the things that come to mind are things like uh, petrochemicals, um, runoff from impervious surfaces like parking lots and things like that. But the biggest pollutant of waterways is actually much more mundane than that and it's just plain old ordinary mud or sediment, and uh, a lot of times that is coming into the waterways from eroding stream banks or just sheet runoff, creating rills and gullies, just, just plain old erosion. Uh, that erosion tends to get into the waterways and it, that, uh, that, er, that sediment partic particles tend to slit, settle out in the water column. Uh, that can choke out fish, chokes out macroinvertebrates, uh, decreases the, uh, um, the amount of light in the water, and uh, if there are minerals in the water, it can, it can, degrade, the, it can degrade the water that way. And uh, one of the biggest factors is uh, it releases mineral phosphorus into the ground. And for those of you who are gardeners, you know, uh, phosphorus is one of the things that is uh, very, very important for your garden. Um, you don't need a lot of it, but um, it's, what, it's what chemists call a limiting factor. So you can have a, a lot of nitrogen and a lot of calcium but you just need a tiny little bit of phosphorus and you'll get a lot of plant growth. And so for waterways, the plant growth we're looking at and we're concerned about is algae. Uh, so with just a little bit of, of phosphorus input from sediment into the waterway, we get these big algal blooms and algal blooms lead to fish die-offs, fish kills. And uh, as algae die off, dies off itself, it depletes the oxygen in the water column. And that's what causes, you know, big fish kills. It's what causes the, the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico is just plain old algae dying off. And the best way to, to manage that is to reduce the amount of, of erosion and the amount of phosphorus going into the ground. So a lot of ways we do this is through directly engaging landowners and stakeholders, uh, public and private. And we help them manage, uh, find ways, find solutions for urban stormwater management, residential man stormwater management, reducing the amount of nutrients on the ground, uh, like fertilizing fields, spreading a poultry litter. Uh, so that's fewer nutrients going into our waterways. Um, sediment capture. So uh, what you're seeing is a uh, is a headwaters pond. So it's a pond really high up in the in the landscape to keep water from rocketing down 
down the uh, valley and down the watershed, picking up steam, picking up velocity and causing more erosion. Uh, we also do invasive species removal, what I'll be talking about today quite a bit of, uh, outdoor recreation, volunteer training, forest management, things like prescribed burns, ecological thins, and uh, streamside management. We have quite a few partners and we can't do we can't do all the great stuff we do without them, so we always want to give them credit. You probably see some familiar some familiar faces on there. Okay, so we'll get into the uh, kind of the the big part of the presentation I'm giving today. Sorry, I've had a busy week and I'm on vacation after this, so my brain is is <laughs> a little bit fried. Um, so we're Basically, we're going to be talking about invasive plant species, and uh, a lot of a lot of people have this big question, you know, what is an invasive plant species? It's a term that gets bandied around quite a bit, used quite a bit. Um, it means different things to different people, and it's it's a definition that's been subjective, and it's it's also changed over the years. So it was originally coined through um, executive order under the Carter administration to basically just mean a species that was not occurring in any anywhere in the United States. And this is a definition that a lot of people still hold to. It's, it was very prevalent. It was the first definition that was, that was officially made. And so when a lot of people say an invasive species, they're, they're meaning it's inferred that the species is, uh, is not native to, to North America. It's native to some other continent. Or as we would say, it's exotic. And we, tend, we kind of tweaked this a little bit in 1999, and we said, well, it has to be not native to an ecosystem and capable of propagating itself and da 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 and uh, we found out well that's that's a little bit vague but in 2016 it was also kind of changed a little bit to this very very specific and they, they decided to separate non-native and invasive species so they wanted to say a non-native species was now defined as a species occurring outside of its natural range with respect to a particular ecosystem and it has to be able to reproduce itself so what that is saying is any species, even if it's native to North America or, or any geographic boundary, you know, the state of Arkansas, the county you live in, if it's not native to that local ecosystem, that the oak pine woodlands or marsh or wetland or something like that, and it's moving in, then in that local context, it, it can be considered invasive, even if it's a highly beneficial native species like a common milkweed. And so that's when they decided to say, well, okay, an, an invasive species is, is an organism that's not native to that local ecosystem, and its introduction into that local ecosystem can cause environmental harm or harm to humans and plant health. And so basically what that says is if you have a species that is native to North America, is native to your county, but it's, it's, uh, but it's in, in a location in an ecosystem where it hasn't historically been, then in that context, it can be invasive. And so that, that opens up that definition to include native, uh, conventionally thought of as native species as well. And we'll talk about that, some examples of that in a little bit. So that, that really shows that, hey, this term is pretty subjective. It's changed quite a bit over the years. And, uh, you know, we've had uh, some discussion and debate arguments about, you know, what, what constitutes as something as exotic. And uh, now we're seeing that um, <clears throat> that uh, that definition can change quite a bit, uh, depending on on what you know what definition you're going off of, whether it was the '77 uh, definition or the 2016 definition. But what we're also seeing is uh, not only is that spatial factor something to be considered, but there's also a temporal factor. So uh, due to global climate change, we're also seeing species shift in their range, and we're seeing species in the northern hemisphere move their range further north than they've historically been. And so we call these climate refugees. Um, and they're as they're shifting their range, they're moving into places they haven't historically inhabited. So that begs the question, you know, do you want to call that an invasive species? Uh, it's not historically been documented in this location, but due to uh, contemporary events, global climate change, it's now moving into that, into that uh, region or eco-region. And so that begs the you know, argument of, you know, what do you think is appropriate to define as, as a species as native? Do you define it by the continent, the state, the county, the eco-region? And so as ecologists, we're starting to move more and more towards the eco-region or specific uh, ecosystems. So we're kind of narrowing down that, that uh, geographic area a little bit. 
And so if you took a species that occurred uh, in a range, you know, 50,000 years ago, but it's no longer in that range today, do you, do you call that an invasive species? Or is a climate refugee an invasive species? And, you know, some, some species like here we have calorie pear, a lot of people consider them, call them Bradford pears, uh, is, is pretty obvious. It's a species that's not native to North America. It's native to Korea, and it doesn't have any kind of biological controls to uh, manage its population naturally. And so here in our context, it's very, very uh, invasive. It's invasive in any, any ecosystem it occurs in in North America. But here's a case that's an exotic Japanese maple that here in North America is never really seen or considered as being invasive. But what they're finding is this is starting to be considered invasive in some other places where it's being cultivated and propagated, such as the uh, United Kingdom. So can you really say it's, you know, as a blanket as a whole, this species is invasive? Well, here in this context, it's not, but over there it is. And here we have a great example of a, uh, of a native North American species, native to Arkansas, as uh, an eastern red cedar. Um, is a native species, but in the right context, it can be uh, invasive. So eastern red cedar is highly adapted, has shallow root systems, and it's highly adapted for a really, really dry, rocky terrain. And so... Uh, it's also not adapted for fire because historically it's thrived on rocky out, outcroppings, bluff faces, and things like that. So it's never really had to, to be like an oak tree and make deep roots going into the ground to reach water table. But what it does is it's a very thirsty tree and it sends its roots out very shallow, very aggressively, and soaks up all that water on, on the in the topsoil. And with the uh, introduction of fire suppression, you know, with Smokey the Bear, only you can prevent wildfires. Uh, one of the unfortunately unfortunate consequences of fire suppression is we've seen an explosion of both eastern red cedar and its cousin um, ashes juniper uh, here in in Arkansas eastern red cedar and in the Great Plains there they have a uh, big problems with ashes juniper because we've taken fire out of the picture that would naturally uh, remove this tree from remove this tree and and keep it in its in its uh, historic habitat or historic ecosystem. <clears throat> so here we have another species that I love to love to talk about, Osage Orange. Uh, a lot of people will say Osage Orange is only native to a certain region in Arkansas, but there are pollen records that show that this species was uh, about 80, I believe 80,000 years ago, was native and it expanded all the way up to the Canadian Shield region in Canada. So going all the way up into Alberta and Manitoba. And so a lot of people will call this invasive but basically, it was dependent on, uh, it's what's called an anachronistic plant or out of its time. And so it depended on uh, North American megafauna in the form of uh, ground sloths, woolly mammoths, and things like that to eat the fruit, disperse the fruit. And uh, with, the, with the end of the Ice Age, these species went extinct. And the, since, they were, since the Osage Orange was dependent on these species, for its distribution, its range collapsed as a result, it had a complete population collapse. And it, it collapsed down to that little era, little region in Arkansas where it was uh, found in the 30s and 40s. And uh, botanists said, well, okay, this is its native range. But as part of the uh, Frank President Roosevelt's New Deal program, we found out, hey, this plant is really great for uh, creating um, natural hedges or natural fence lines. You can plant it in a, in a slurry, in a, in a furrow, and it'll create this barbed wire-like gnarly mess that even a, even a hog can't go through. So due to the New Deal program, its range was re-expanded back all the way up into the, into the Great Plains, all the way back up into Montana and places where it historically was. But a lot of botanists will still say it's an invasive species or it, it's uh, been in, introduced to those areas. In the context of the last 5,000 years, yes, that's true, but in the context of the last, you know, 50, 100,000 years, that's, that's not true. And here's another case of uh, Magnolia tri tripetala. Um, a lady planted this tree in uh, New England, and uh, out of its, north of its native range, and what we're finding is its native range is collapsing due to global climate change, and it's new, it's the range that it is now uh, hospitable to is, is the place where this lady planted them. So it's a climate refugee. And so uh, 
people are arguing, you know, should we protect that species where it is or remove it as an invasive or and things like that. So the terminology is very subjective to the user, user but basically the takeaway is any species that's not native to the local ecosystem and has the ability to reproduce is pre predisposed to be invasive. So if you take any species whatsoever, put it into a new context and it can reproduce and it can thrive in that, in that environment, in that ecosystem, it can be invasive. Doesn't mean it's going to be, but it can be. And it's not a right versus wrong. It's not really a moral issue. There's no such thing as a right plant or a bad plant. There's just a right plant in the wrong place. Um, I've removed a lot of bush honeysuckle and Chinese privet in my career. And, uh, you know, I've had a, a great friend who was visiting China and I was just kind of blown away when she was sending me pictures and I saw Chinese privet in the background. And part of me just wanted to be like, ah, get rid of that. It's Chinese privet. But she was in a, she was in a suburb of Shanghai where it's native. So it, it was a kind of an eye opening experience for me. But a uh, rhododendron is native here, but is highly invasive there and as well as morning glory. So go figure. But um, to prevent a species from becoming invasive in your area before you introduce it, just figure out if it's native to your eco region or not and uh, you know, reach out to, to someone who's, who's knowledgeable in that. And so some other terms that you'll probably hear bandied around quite a bit or used quite a bit are terms like uh, exploit. And this is not a moral term. This is a term used by ecologists to just say make use of. So uh, a chickadee will exploit your bird feeder. Uh, a hummingbird will exploit a, uh, a morning glory flower, a trumpet vine, or, and things like that. There's just, it's, it's a natural way of, of saying uh, an organism is making use of something else. We hear escaped, it basically means that someone planted this, this cultivar here and it, it uh, was able to reproduce and now it's, its offspring are going elsewhere, places where they didn't anticipate. So they're growing up in the nearby woods. Naturalize is when an escaped species maintains a, uh, a stable enough population that it can start reproducing on its own without any external factors. And uh, that's when it starts becoming invasive uh, weed is a, always a difficult term, what we call an, an anthrocentric term, which may, means it's a human-centered term. And that's basically referring to any plant that's not valued for, you know, use, quote unquote, or beauty, or if, you know, if I can't use it and I don't like the way it looks or whatever reason, then I might call it a weed. But that doesn't mean it's a bad plant. Um, if it's an opportunistic plant, that means it is a probably a very competitive plant that's capable of quickly exploiting uh, situations like uh, disturbances. So if someone comes in and changes something on the landscape or even naturally a tree falls, there's a storm, uh, some plants are gonna be better able to take advantage of that uh, ecological niche that's been opened up uh, than others. Cultivar is a uh, you know, species that has been selected for various traits over time and uh, native R is basically a cultivar that is um, of, a, of a native species. So most invasive species are, are del deliberately introduced, about 60% are deliberate and 40% of those are through the whole horticulture trade. A lot of times you'll unfortunately find these in uh, nurseries, uh, garden centers, places like that, or in a bag of, of grass seed mix. Uh, a lot of times the bags of compost and manure you buy at the hardware store will, will oftentimes have really bad seeds in them. So be careful with those. And um, <clears throat> sometimes the pots you buy from the, from the nursery, they might have other seeds in them. So I recently bought a lot of, a lot of plants that unfortunately had a, uh, a uh, nasty weed that was coming up in them. So I had to quarantine them basically until I was able to weed out that, that exotic um, was a mulberry, Chinese mulberry crab weed or something like that, I think it was called, if I remember right. And some are, some are accidentally introduced through conservation, uh, like uh, Chinese Lespedeza was introduced for uh, forage and, uh, and soil erosion. So that's uh, you know, unfortunate for conservation. And then some are introduced through homeopathy. 11% uh, are accidental. Some get introduced through seed, livestock, uh, packaging contaminants, uh, vessel ballast, which is basically um, the uh, the bottom of a ship, and uh, 20 28 percent we're just not really sure. Up here in Northwest Arkansas, you know, these are some invasive species that we see quite a bit. It's going to differ a little bit uh, for for some of y'all. Um, I know from Central Arkansas, my my career there, my experiences there, uh, uh, 
uh, bush honeysuckle, or excuse me, Chinese privet is is really the most dominant one. Uh, as I like to say, it's the it's the most invasive species in North America, uh, even more so than than kudzu because it takes over so much more area. <clears throat> And they can be often transferred and introduced through uh, things like uh, machinery, vehicles, transporting soil, animals, and clothing, uh, wind, horticulture, landscaping, manure, mulch, uh, waterways. And you'll sometimes hear people refer to the quote unquote tens rule. This is a really, really outdated, unfortunate uh, rule of thumb. It does not, it's not accurate at all. But uh, a lot of people will argue that, hey, this species is okay to be introduced because only 10% of them will escape and uh, 10 to 50 of those, 10 to 50 percent of those that escape will actually become a nuisance. So if I release or introduce this exotic species, then there's just a really small chance that it's going to be a problem. So you know, who cares? And that, we don't really like that because that's, that's really misleading. It's promoting apathy. All you need is just one escaped species to become a, uh, an ecological nightmare that's going to cost millions, if not billions of dollars. And some of the other, other ones we'll commonly see up here, like leatherleaf mahonia, Oregon grape. It's one I see pretty regularly planted around, but uh, I can go walk out in the woods and I guarantee I'll find this thing popping up. Uh, barberries as well. Wineberry is one. Uh, this was planted. People absolutely, it's a relative of, of uh Blackberries, it has a very, very flavorful, delicious fruit. So people like planting it, but it escapes and just goes crazy. And so this is when we get kind of, kind of technical. So what really makes an invasive species invasive? <clears throat> and so basically you have different life history of, of species and um, plants and animals, they're always competing with each other for, for space, light, nutrients, um, one thing that a lot of people don't really ever, uh, a lot of times they don't think about is they're also um, competing with, uh, with services like pollination. So if you have two flowers growing side by side and you got a bee flying around, both those, both those flowers are trying to attract the bee's attention. So the bee will pollinate the plant, fertilize its seed, and it can continue its reproductive cycle. So that's kind of a, a, a form of competition that, that a lot of people don't, don't consider and kind of undervalue. But um, in ecological terms, when we talk about when we talk about uh, some of these things like uh, production, so we might talk about plants like they're a bottom-up producer. Basically, what that is is if you have any kind of animal, they have to depend on on uh, production or, or plant matter to to sustain a population. And then if something like uh, the deer is eating is eating the plants, we call that a, a top-down consumption. So that deer is actively putting pressure on that on that plant population and uh, basically preventing it from from exploding. Because the more grass you have, the the more food there are for the deer. The more deer you have, the more the more they're going to eat the grass. And the cycle continues. So the basically the deer are keeping the grass and the plants in check. And uh, then we have some other factors like disease um, basically come in and, and uh, start killing things um, basically due to population density. But um, basically as a rule, non-natives kind of break these rules. They don't really play by the same rules that natives do because they didn't grow up in the same ecosystem. They didn't evolve with the same other organisms. So kind of they're, they're cheating. They're playing by fewer rules. And uh, what happens is they don't really have that that top-down pressure. So deer may eat that and may eat that privet, but they would rather eat the trilliums and they would rather eat the native species. And so what that does is that escalates that pressure on top of those natives and it decreases that pressure on those in, on those exotic or those invasive species. So what happens is you're kind of getting a positive feedback loop. So you're getting more more consumption, more pressure on your natives, and less consumption, less pressure on those exotics and invasives. So that's giving those exotic invasives a, an unfair advantage, so to speak. <clears throat> and uh, so here's a great example of that. Have any, has anyone uh, seen a, a deer exclusion area? So if you're not familiar with it, this is a, a concept where you, you 
you wonder are how much impact are white-tailed deer having on on the native uh, plant populations in your in your forests, especially around urban forests. And so some scientists got this wild idea, and they started creating these deer exclusion areas. So they'd fence off an area where deer can't get in, and then they would see well what grows, what comes up, and they found out that. Uh, they would get this massive explosion of these really wonderful native species that have always been there and just come back, grow back every year. But uh, every spring, the deer come in and munch them all to the ground. And so what happens is when you have too many deer and not enough things controlling their population, they're putting too much pressure on those on that native flora, on the grasses and the wildflowers, things like that. And so you wind up with this highly... Uh, consumed area, highly disturbed area outside the fence where anything coming up green gets chomped immediately and then everything on the inside of the fence is able to grow and thrive. And so what they found was the deer were actually selecting or, or going out of their way to look for these native plant species and avoiding the exotic species because that's not what they evolved with. They don't really, they didn't really recognize it and they didn't prefer to eat it. <clears throat> and these are just some examples to kind of give you an idea of what, what invasive species look like, you know, how dense they can get. So uh, we do a lot of invasive species removals up here in the top. Uh, we have one in Fayetteville where we were removing bush honeysuckle, and this is just a before and after. You could see that, that wall of green uh, where we cut out the bush honeysuckle, and then uh, we, you can see the, the forest that was, was uh, opened up. Uh, that sunlight is, is uh, now hitting the forest floor and um, is gonna be more beneficial for, for plants and animals. Bottom left is uh, an urban forest in Fayetteville uh, called Mount Sequoia Woods, 97 acre urban forest, and this is in the fall. So you couldn't really see the, the flora, but I took, a, uh, I took and I marked each one of the stumps where we'd removed that and uh, where we removed bush honeysuckle. And so that gives you an idea how dense that is. Uh, this was one site where we removed bush honeysuckle and uh, the forest floor was completely barren of, of all, you know, there were no wildflowers, no grasses, no beneficial forbs or beneficial uh, plants for deer, turkey, quail, and things like that. And so um, we came in and did an invasive plant removal and we didn't seed this at all. And this was, uh, I believe, two years or maybe even one year after we performed that removal this is the, the regrowth we saw of, of native wildflowers. And uh, all that green stuff you're seeing are, are all uh, spring beauties. And so this was just absolutely gorgeous in the springtime. <clears throat> so what invasive species do is they basically exploit those natural and man-made disturbances. So if you come in and uh, you cut down some trees or you move some machinery around, you, you basically change the ecosystem any. Uh, those invasive species, they have a they have a predisposition to being better able to to move in and take advantage of that opening you've created. And what they do is once they get established, they they fundamentally alter the the ecosystem's uh, interactions between its wildlife. So they change the interaction between the deer and and the the native plants. They're shifting that pressure onto those native plants, and they're changing the sunlight. So they're that bush honeysuckle or that privet is shading out the understory so there's less vegetation and at the same time they're, they're growing over and out competing that vegetation. So they're competing for structure, space, uh, soil, nutrients, they're competing for water, uh, beneficial bacteria uh, interactions in the soil, um, herbivory like we were talking about, they're taking that, the deer are preferring to eat the, the natives, uh, predation too. And this is one that people also really don't Aren't, aren't as aware of, but they do what they kind of, they steal pollination services. So um, one unfortunate thing is people will plant an exotic species and they'll say, yeah, and we'll, you know, might advocate, you should remove that and plant this other thing instead. Well, what do they say? But the butterflies love it. The birds love it. Look at this plant. It's got so many bees on it. But here's, here's the issue with that. If you see that bird or that butterfly, those bees on that plant, that means that that organism, that that uh, pollinator, isn't visiting a native, and because of that, that native might go unpollinated. It might go without that service, 
the bird might not be eating the fruit and distributing the fruit, so that plant can, can successfully continue its reproductive cycle that year um, because that, that organism is too busy focusing on this exotic species because it might have richer nectar or juicier fruit, sweeter fruit, or something like that. <clears throat> and so some of the some things that can really change that natural uh, that natural ecosystem, the kind of the, the thing that keeps it in balance is called a disturbance regime. So it can be a change in the fuel load, clearing out the understory, uh, changing the fire intensity or severity or frequency. So taking natural fire out of the out of the equation or even burning a place that that shouldn't ever be burned is also a factor. Um, places that uh, it might might be might suffer from a drought or flood or uh, even a tornado comes through. A tornado comes through, and then all of a sudden you've got uh, a, a row of bush honeysuckle that's that's going through the lane or right away easement or something like that. Anything that kind of upsets the the balance, so to speak, uh, opens up an opportunity for for an exotic invasive to move in. So basically those inv invasive exotics, they suffer few of those negative pressures and they may enjoy more positive pressures. Um, <clears throat> and they also simultaneously create that positive feedback loop where they're decreasing and reducing and suppressing native populations. And so it creates that positive feedback and that furthers the invasion and reduces native communities until eventually, especially in urban areas, you start seeing a, a complete replacement of native communities to uh, to exotic species, <clears throat> and um, so invasive species they can they can uh, damage degrade those natural ecosystems, reduce their ecological function, so reducing the amount of uh, of uh, forage for wildlife, reducing the amount of stormwater filtration, erosion prevention, things like that. Uh, they just don't look as good a lot of times, and so we see an area that just looks trashy, so to speak. We might see these vines growing up and twisting around trees. Um, that's an indication that there's probably invasive plant species there. Uh, um, disrupt those food webs and they can, that can cause um, um, extinction events or localized extinction events, what we call extirpations. They can also synergize with other invasive species. And so here in Northwest Arkansas, we have a tree of heaven, which is a really bad invasive tree. And we're starting to see populations of the spotted lantern fly moving in, which hosts on the on tree of heaven. And so here you have two of those that, uh, you know, one is individually they're bad enough, but when combined, they're even even worse. Um, Chinese Lespedeza or Cerisi Lespedeza, as folks call it, and Japanese beetles are another good example. And, and another one we're really seeing made, that I a lot of people... That lantern fly had made to Arkansas already. I believe we just recently got reports of it. Yeah. Oh, horrible. Ugh. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it's wonderful news. Uh, and another thing that we're seeing is uh, the spread of tick vector diseases. There's a positive correlation or a positive relationship between the spread of invasive understory shrubbery and tick vector diseases like Rocky Mountain spotted fever and Lyme disease. So basically what's happening is urban forests are becoming so choked with invasive plants and invasive understory shrubs. Um, deer like those areas because they tend to be uh, shell, they tend to be dense. They tend to be a lot of times uh, uh, prone to the, the species might be more evergreen than the deciduous natives. And so they, they feel safer there. And what happens is those, those deer populations become more concentrated and so with those populations becoming more concentrated, they become more likable, more uh, beneficial for, for parasites like ticks. And uh, that increases the rate of deer that get infected by those, by those diseases. And so we're seeing a, a, a big increase due to that. Um, the ways you can prevent it are things like cleaning off machinery. If you're going into a new place, uh, make sure you're not tracking in a bunch of seeds. Uh, you're not um, tracking in seeds on your tires, on your clothes, things like that. Your dog isn't covered in seeds that you're going to be ha hauling in or, or the dog's introducing. Um, if you're buying plants from the nursery, consider keeping them and keeping them aside and watch them for a little while. Make sure there's nothing that's going to germinate coming up. You don't see any weeds coming up that's going to uh, cross contaminate or go to seed and and uh, and proliferate around your garden. Or if you're doing a planting, it's not going to proliferate there. 
Um, if you are introducing manure or mulch, you know, there's that possibility that you're going to have seed or haze, um, hay or hay and straw, or excuse me, um, hay is another good example. Uh, will oftentimes have, have seeds in it. Um, so keep an eye on that or consider monitoring it after you've, after you've introduced that material. Um, a lot of species that are invasive are annuals. And so one of the best effective, one of the most effective methods for managing those is to just deadhead them. Uh, like perillament's a good example. You can just go in with a, a weed whip or a weed eater and just deadhead it after it's flowered. So uh, it's not going to go to seed and, and spread that seed. So that's a, a really cheap and effective way of managing annuals. And uh, one of the best things is just provide, uh, provide alternatives. Um, so if you have if you want to one recommendation I always have is if you have a plant that has red berries on it, like this Nandina, and you know that Nandina is being spread by by species, the birds that are distributing the fruit, then offer an alternative for those birds like a deciduous holly, hawthorn, viburnums, things like that. So don't just remove the Nandina because the birds are eating that fruit for a reason, probably because there's not enough uh, options in the landscape in the region around there. So give them something to eat and uh, they'll probably start picking, choosing that native rather than the exotic. And uh, when the wildlife starts exploiting that native, then they're distributing that fruit and you're, you're kind of doubling your effort and you're getting the wildlife to do work for you because now they're distributing the fruit of that native beneficial species that you're wanting to encourage rather than the exotic species you're, you're battling and actively trying to reduce. <clears throat> and uh, so basically what I always recommend is uh, whenever you're, you're looking to, to develop a management plan for, for dealing with invasive species, kind of, kind of develop a plan. Um, you want to first identify what it is, you know, been a, hopefully learn its botanical name. You know, and from there you can learn all about its life history. Is it an annual? Is it a perennial? Does it like dry soil, wet soil, full sun, and all that stuff? Um, assess it. How much is it? Where is it? Uh, how dense? How densely populated is it? Is it just a couple of them, or is it really spread out and and uh, exploding in the area? And uh, if you're not sure what it is, you know, report it to someone. Report it uh, through iNaturalist or the Invasive Plant ID and Removal in the United States, on a Facebook group, uh, places like that. Because um, a lot of times uh, we may not be aware of a species that's been introduced and in becoming invasive until we start seeing uh, observations coming up through iNaturalist and things like that. Uh, we found an, uh, a few observations for uh, Chinese jet bead up here in Northwest Arkansas. And because of that, we were able to identify the location and, and quickly go out and and treat that before it got out of hand <laughs> and uh, prioritize. And this one is a little bit counterintuitive. If you know, you a lot of people will see a big population of invasive species and uh, they want to just tackle that. And a lot of times they kind of overlook uh, uh, another species that might, that's just there. There's not a whole lot of it. And uh, what we usually recommend is ac actually get rid of that one that is not very populous before you take on the, the one that's really prolific. Because what you're going to do is if you take care of all that really populated species, you're going to create a, a create your, you've created a big ecological disturbance. Like we talked about earlier, you created a blank slate for that second species to come in. And it says, hey, look, you've gotten rid of my competition. Now I don't have anything keeping me from, from taking over. Great, thanks. And so um, what we call that ecological release. So if you have, a um, good example is Asian bittersweet. Uh, Asian bittersweet tends to be outcompeted by Chinese privet. So if you have a little bit of Asian bittersweet, you've got a lot of Chinese privet, you come in and you take out all the Chinese privet and then all of a sudden, oh my gosh, you've got Asian bittersweet everywhere. And uh, it's, a, it's a really common uh, problem we see or perillament or something like that. Um, <clears throat> if you find out what species it is, this is a great resource, the Biota of North America program. Uh, I have this bookmarked and I use it pretty regularly. To, this tells me uh, uh, where, where these species are located, what counties are they located in. <clears throat> this is what it looks like. So it's also color coded. The uh, lime green color tells me that, hey, this species is native and historic to this area. 
the yellow tells me this is pretty rare. And if I come across it, I need to let someone know. I need to let you know Theo Witzel with Arkansas Natural Heritage know, hey, I found this. It's not been found since like the 50s or something like that. Um, if it's in this blue map that tells me that this species is not native, it was probably introduced. Like uh, in this case, uh, this is an example of, uh, of uh, two, two Euonima species and one, uh, one uh, exotic Euonima species, uh, winged uh, burning bush or winged spindle tree. That's All three of these look very similar, but uh, burning bush is, is, has really been prolifically planted in several landscapes all across the United States, and, uh, but it was introduced. Whereas uh, strawberry bush and uh, eastern wahoo are both native and uh, pretty common in eastern Ar eastern North America. And uh, some good ways to, pr to prioritize invasive species management. Um, like I said earlier, prevent the establishment of new species first and then eradicate small and isolated populations. And uh, if you have a, a special habitat you're really trying to protect, like you have a stream, a riparian area, a, a glade, grasslands, or things like that, you've got a really special high conservation value area, focus on that. Um, recreation areas is a good one. Um, recreation areas tend to get a lot of disturbance and uh, um, a lot of attention, so people are usually really supportive of that. It's a good way to get volunteers to come out and, hey, you know, let's Let's take uh, invasive plants out of the park. Let's have an invasive plant pool or so, something like that. Um, set, you know, really, really set specific and manageable goals. Don't try to just say, I'm going to get rid of the, all the bush honeysuckle or privet or whatever on my property. <clears throat> but do you want to eradicate it, you know, contain it, just keep it from, from spreading or uh, suppress it? So you know it's going to come back, but you just want to keep it from from uh, exploding until you can have, you know, a big team come out and deal with it or some equipment or something like that. So you just want to kind of suppress it until you are better able to, to manage it. But, um, and that can be expressed as like, you know, reducing its spatial size, reducing its extent or reducing its density, um, deadheading it to prevent it from going to seed, um, prevent, if it's an invasive vine, preventing it from killing trees like kudzu or, um, maintaining access to infrastructure so like uh, keeping it from clogging roads and uh, power lines and things like that and uh, one of the biggest things is use adaptive management so what that means is if you go in and you you intend to in, intend to take an action um, there's going to be some kind of reaction from the landscape so if i do this then something's going to happen in response to that if i if I clear out all these shrubs, then I've introduced a lot of sunlight to the forest floor and I'm probably gonna have a bunch of seeds germinate from the seed bank. So how am I gonna manage that? Or if I get rid of that kudzu over, or if I get rid of that privet over there, you know, I've got this Asian bittersweet over here, what's that bittersweet going to do? So kind of kind of think about that, uh, what, what reaction the landscape is gonna have to your, to your action. And a lot of people choose, this is a whole other topic, practically going to a whole other presentation by itself, of a, you know, mechanical removal, manual, um, that's supposed to say smothering, not mothering, or uh, using chemical intensive grazing like uh, sheep or cattle, um, flame weeding is popular, or classic biocontrols, or uh, any combination thereof. And so this is just uh, some, some common invasive plant species that we'll see. Um, <laughs> When I moved up here in 2017, I went to a local park in a nearby town of Farmington and I saw this bush honeysuckle and I, and I said, wow, what a, what a cute little plant. Look at that. It's got those gorgeous little red berries on it. I just love that plant. It's so cute. And then I found out, hey, this is a, this is a really obnoxious invasive shrub up here in Northwest Arkansas. <laughs> it completely changed my perspective. Um, Japanese steel grass, you'll see a lot of times any kind of, any kind of, uh, fairly moist area along trails, near streams, uh, uh, river, river valleys, places like that. Um, it likes moisture. And so even places where uh, you get a good fog in the morning, um, it, it'll do just fine in those areas. Multiflora rose, if you've ever battled this, um, you know how awful it is because uh, you, you come away looking like you got into a losing match with a bobcat. Um, Chinese privet, uh, those purple fruits on there are droops, uh, they're stone fruits, and uh, they float. So this is what we call a hydrochore. 
the the fruit floats on water and it's a terrible riparian and stream invasive because um when storm waters come up that storm water shakes the tree and it's an it's a relative of olives so just like a shaken olive tree it drops all those little droops on the ground they float on the water they float downstream and they float on top of that storm water and the storm water gets up into these uh, woodlands, the storm water goes down and then all of a sudden you've got all these privet seedlings that have been deposited on the ground and they and then they germinate. Um, Perilla mint or horse mint or excuse me, uh, beefsteak plant or uh, shiso if you go into a uh, East Asian market. This is a, uh, a very, very common culinary plant, uh, especially for Korean cooking. Um, and it's a uh, it's a mint. And uh, like all mints, they're very, very uh, well adapted for attracting pollinators, especially wasps and, uh, and bees. And so Perilla mint attracts a ton of uh, wasps and, and bees and will reseed vigorously. Um, Japanese honeysuckle is another uh, notorious one. And uh, these are just some resources. Uh, so we can look at the uh, Arkansas Native Plant Society. Uh, the Northwest Arkansas Native Plant Hub is a Facebook group that came up for people looking to purchase native plants or ask where they could acquire native plants or even sell native plants up here in Northwest Arkansas. Uh, the Ozark chapter of the Wild Ones has a lot of great material, like uh, learning what native plants to plant for this, for this uh, kind of habitat. Uh, what plants are deer tolerant, or if you want to remove a, a chemical out of the soil, um, how to phytoremediate with this other, other kind of plant. The Biota of North America program is great, Arkansas Natural Heritage Commission. Um, if you're really wanting to uh, uh, manage uh, invasive plant species, I really recommend these two. They're no longer in print, but they, you can download PDFs of both the field guide for the identification of invasive plants in southern forests, and it's complement uh, a management guide for invasive plants in southern forests. University of Arkansas Extension Service, uh, Missouri Department of Conservation is a fantastic resource uh, for learning how uh, techniques for managing a specific plant species. So if you just type in uh, Missouri Department of Conservation privet management, they'll give you lots of recommendations for that. If you're just trying to identify it, iNaturalist is the way to go as uh, one I would recommend. And uh, if you're just wanting to see uh, like ecoregions of, of Arkansas, um, you know, where species are going to be native to, then, then I recommend looking at the EPA's website. And then there's some other resources there as well. Um, some really common uh, native species that I always recommend if you're looking to replace an invasive plant species. So if you've got an invasive tree and you're wanting to replace that, these are some good ones to go to, um, as well as shrubs, grasses, and wildflowers. And uh, Dan, I'd be happy to send you these two since I don't know, I don't expect people to access this as well here. I was just going to ask. Thank you. <laughs> I got some good pictures of uh, uh, sycamores, pawpaws. It's pawpaw season. Uh, if you're if you're curious, I collected a few yesterday. Um, cottonwoods. Um, all these are great, great species for replacing invasive plant species. Um, if you're looking to, you know, help those bees, help those pollinators, plant nine bark. Oh my God, plant button bush. It's a pollinator magnet. I don't think I've ever seen a plant that will have as many butterflies on it as button bush. Um, if you are wanting to feed birds, uh, not uh, viburnums, things like that. Um, fantastic grasses. Some of these can be extremely competitive and aggressive themselves. And if you're dealing with a, a, an exotic invasive, then a lot of times uh, using a very aggressive native is recommended. So if you see the term naturalize uh, on a plant, uh, especially like through the Missouri uh, Botanical Garden, um, that means it's an aggressive plant that tends to tends to be very competitive and tends to make a, it wants to make a little clump, a little colony by itself, and it tends to want to push everything out else out. And um, if you're wanting a tidy little garden, that's not necessarily what you want. But if you're looking for uh, if you're looking for um, low maintenance, or you're looking for it to outcompete an exotic species or keep it from moving in, then that's that's a a good one to go to. And some good wildflowers. And uh, yeah, that's what I got here. So I was just trying to give a kind of an overhead uh, 
view, so to speak, of managing invasive plant species. Really wanted to kind of give an introduction briefly of, you know, the mechanism that makes them invasive. So when you hear people talk about invasive, you know, plant this, don't plant that, it's not really a xenophobic, we hate that plant because it's from the Mediterranean or Asia or anything like that. The biggest thing to realize about invasive exotics is they, they lack the biological controls um, our, that indigenous species have. And because of that, their populations tend to explode. And when they explode, they suppress everything else around them. So they suppress those natives and they create that positive feedback loop where the, the organisms which uh, are meant to put pressure on those, on those populations like deer, brow, deer eating uh, trilliums, things like that, it increases and escalates that pressure. So I hope, I hope I didn't get too far into the weeds and so to speak, no puns intended. And I hope that was uh, beneficial and educational for everyone. Yeah, thank you, Nate. Uh, can you go back a slide? Vicky wanted to see something. I think that's the slide that you wanted, right, Vicky? Or another one? Let me know. Um, again, if you have questions, you're welcome to take yourself off mute and ask or post your questions in the chat. And uh, I will say, I was thinking about the definition of invasive, and I wonder if in part it's whether or not the species creates an ecological problem that needs to be addressed. So like Eurasian collar dove is out there all over the place. Is it really out competing our natives, native bird species? Is it causing a problem for native, for native bird species? I'm not really sure about that. I've seen them bully and morning dove sometimes, um, but is it really invasive or is it just exotic? So maybe just because something's out there and spreading itself around does not necessarily make it invasive unless it's a problem for us or our biodiversity. Right, a good example I, I like to give is Indian heliotrope. Um, it tends to be a very opportunistic little plant. So uh, if there's an area that has a soil disturbance, I see it a lot of times around uh, marshlands and uh, wet areas, lakes especially, water table water rises and kills out inundates a lot of the plants goes back down and creates that really really fertile soil and a lot of times i'll see this explosion of indian heliotrope on it and uh within six months it's all gone it's like it never existed and uh but um japanese stiltgrass extremely invasive persists and uh, is able to to create a wedge in the local ecosystem and kind of force everything else out until it's 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 established itself. And so that's kind of what we mean by something is invasive. It has the ability to, it, it, to assert itself in the ecosystem. Whereas another exotic like the Indian heliotrope might just move in and take advantage of an opening that was created, complete its life cycle, and then it's, it's gone until that opportunity presents itself again. And Um, please say more on milkweed. Deadheading does not work on perilla. I did not know that. Is perilla an annual or perennial? Um, I, I have some information on the perilla that if you just deadhead it or you just mow it, all of the tops that you mow off and it falls off to the side and you get a rain, they will root down and start again. I never had perilla on my property until about four years ago when I got a bad bale of hay. And I mean, I've been pulling it, but if you just chop it off, that root will grow up and you will see little tiny flowerets everywhere the stem and the leaf meets. So deadheading perilla doesn't work. And also, could you mention that mimosa is becoming a real problem in our forest, please? Are you aware of the mimosa? And I'm done. Yeah, mimosa or Persian silk tree, um, julep, albizia julibrissum um, is, a, is really common. It's a it's a leguminous plant, and like a lot of legumes, it's uh, it's very adept for um, existing in really, really harsh uh, infertile soils, and it, it tends to do really well um, along riparian areas and stream banks. 
and it's charismatic. It has those gorgeous little uh, pink puffball flowers. And because of that, people see the hummingbirds uh, feeding off of it. And so they say, I don't want to cut that down. It's got hummingbirds feeding on it. When it comes to birds and berries, my understanding is that uh, birds really don't, don't like the, a lot of the exotic invasive species that much. They prefer the natives and they will strip the natives away and then, they'll, then they will turn to the exotic species when it's starvation time, when later in winter, when there's less food around. Um, it's like Nandina is poisonous to birds and it's nasty stuff and they will eat the berries, but uh, I don't know if I've ever seen, I know cedar wax wings will eat the berries, but I don't know if I've ever seen them do that because they really don't want to if they can avoid it. Yeah, they'd much prefer honeysuckle berries or viburnum or uh, deciduous holly or hawthorn or, or something. But in landscapes where people aren't planting those species in their front yards, they're planting nandinas, then your cedar wax wings don't have anything to, to eat off of. And so it's kind of like, it's kind of like having a kid and you want them to eat healthy, but you've also got a bowl of Jolly Ranchers sitting on the kitchen counter. And so if you got a good kid, they're probably going to, they might prefer to eat healthy, but what if you just don't feed them? Then they're just going to subsist on Jolly Ranchers and be unhealthy. Uh, the question is, um, what aggressive native grasses can outcompete the invasives? So there are a lot of native grasses that are very aggressive. I'd say the two, the two I know of that are probably the most aggressive that are native are probably wood oats, river oats, um, chasmanthium latifolium, and uh, deer tongue grass, uh, um, dicanthelium clandestinum. Um, these both tend to grow very, very densely. Uh, and uh, if you've ever tried to manage a little patch of wood, wood oats, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. It reseeds itself very, very vigorously. And uh, it, it definitely can outshade uh, some, some invasive species like uh, still grass. And I've seen, and I've seen um, jewelweed just completely outcompete still grass as well. The so to plant uh, landscaper designer Benjamin Vogt, who has a book about using natives, uh, he recommends using a lot of grasses and sedges in your garden and planting wildflowers in between those grasses and sedges. And those grasses and sedges form a green mulch, as he calls it, and really help to keep the weeds down, um, help keep the invasives out. And I've found that's true in my own garden and I need to put some more grasses and sedges in places where I don't have enough of that stuff. And, uh... John did ask for me to say more on milkweed, but I'm not really sure what, what the question is there, John. So if you want to elaborate on that, I'd be happy to, to talk to that. Um, Tass uh, asked, uh, any notes on the uh, Johnson grass? So this is, this is one I absolutely hate. I hate Johnson grass so much. Um, so I do a lot of outreach and uh, education with, with uh, pasture landowners and, um, Cattlemen absolutely love Johnson grass because uh, it tends to have a really high sugar content. It's really, really nutritious for cattle. And so <clears throat> um, they absolutely love it. But on the other hand, if they harvest it at the wrong time, if it goes, if it, there's a frost at the wrong time, um, it'll burst cells within the, in the plant that release a toxin or it will, if it gets uh, frost at the wrong time, it will also become a, uh, um, host for a, a, a pathogen that will will kill cattle. Really, really, um, it's a really, really virulent toxin for cattle. Um, so I always encourage pasture landowners to not use Johnson grass and to you know opt for uh, native warm season grasses instead. There's lots of articles and peer peer reviewed uh, material that say that cattle will produce uh, just as much, if not more, biomass uh, eating warm season grasses as, as opposed to uh, monoculture of Johnson grass. Um, but Johnson grass is an extremely difficult, vigorous, uh, tough invasive grass to get rid of because it forms these really, really dense uh, um, uh, roots underneath the ground. So it holds a lot of resources. And it's one of those um, 
you can mechanically remove it, but if you mechanically remove it, you probably won't get all of those little little roots and uh, they'll just, it'll, they'll come back really aggressively. And by doing that, you also create a lot of soil disturbance, which opens up the uh, ecosystem to, to invasion by other species. So it's, as much as I don't like it, it is one of those, you almost have to use an herbicide on it. Um, it just, just because it's, it's, it's so difficult to get rid of. Hey, John, I'll give you the last question, John Webb. No, yeah. Oh, okay. Fine. Can barely hear you, John. Can you type your question in the chat, please? Sure. Yeah, I, we were fighting Johnson grass constantly at the Little Rock Audubon Center. It's invaded a good portion of our hillside, so it takes a lot of repeated herbicide to take care of that stuff. Yeah, and um, I cannot remember the the recommended herbicide for that, but it is it is a very selective herbicide um, that's really meant for Johnson grass. Outrider, I believe, is what we're using. Yeah, okay. And I always, I always tell people, herbicide is is a tool and like any other tool it can be used appropriately and responsibly or it can be absolutely abused um, we see a lot of herbicide use that is just is just frankly wild and abuse um, you know big broadcast sprays on the side of the road just just, just to to manage weeds quote unquote or fence lines um, where it causes these big patches of of no vegetation that cause erosion and things like that. Yeah, that's just irresponsible and abusive. Um, John's asking whether uh, some milkweeds are invasive. And also, if you have any comments about clovers, whether they're invasive or not. Okay. Uh, let's see. I'm not familiar with any milkweeds specifically that are invasive. Um, common milkweed is very aggressive and it's a native, but it can be invasive. So whenever people are planting uh, pollinator patches for monarchs, I, I always recommend, you know, if you're wanting to put common milkweed or, or include common milkweed, um, give it its own space because it is frankly a bully and it will bully everything else around it. And uh, so in that local context, it is invasive. But that doesn't mean we need to go out and kill out all the common milkweed growing everywhere. Um, but it, it will take over in whatever space you give it. And uh, for, for pollinators, monarchs, that's great. Um, there are a lot of people who talk about uh, tropical milkweed. And um, the issue with that is uh, the reason monarchs uh, feed off of milkweed is so they can absorb a toxic chemical that is in milkweed um, into their system. And it's that toxin that, that protects them from birds. And uh, so common milkweed, or excuse me, tropical milkweed doesn't have the, uh, the level of that toxin that those caterpillars need. And so the argument is if those caterpillars, if too many caterpillars start eating too many uh, tropical milkweeds, birds start eating those caterpillars or those, those butterflies, excuse me, then those birds don't get sick. Those birds don't learn, hey, this is poisonous. I can't eat that. Then you'll wind up with more loss of monarchs and you'll wind up with sick and dead birds. And so, you know, we have several different species of, of common or excuse me, of native milkweed. So, you know, plant something that's indigenous rather than planting something that's exotic um, to support the species that is also indigenous because those, those monarchs didn't evolve with tropical milkweed. Uh, some, some tropical uh, butterfly did. Um, <clears throat> comments on clovers. Um, Typically, when people talk about clovers, they're they're referring to trifolias, um, so like uh, white clovers and red clovers. Those are both exotic species. Our native clovers don't tend to look like that. We do have one that is uh, called a uh, running buffalo clover, and uh, you'll only see it in a very few places. Camp Robinson Special Use Area uh, in Central Arkansas is a fantastic place, and it is it is a uh, fire obligate species. Um, it's a, it's a beautiful little plant, beautiful little clover, but it can only germinate after a, after a fire. Um, so it's a, it's a serotonous species, we would call it. 
<clears throat> well, thank you, Nate. I appreciate you sharing your uh, your time and expertise with us. It's been very informative. Um, so 